This episode of Dopey is brought to you by our sponsor, Aloe Recovery, located in sunny Southern California, in Malibu and Silver Lake. Aloe was created by our good friend Bob Forrest and his friends, Evan, Jared, and Bob, to create a rehab that treats addicts and alcoholics with compassion and connection rather than control. They have decades and decades of experience treating addiction as well as, well as co-occurring mental health disorders, including severe mental illness. They have amenities you wouldn't believe. Horseback riding, fucking sweat lodge, sound bath meditation. They also make sure that your detox is as comfortable as it can be, which is crucial when you're kicking heroin or benzos or alcohol or anything. Most importantly, the people that have been to Aloe say they was, had a good experience and that the people there had great hearts. So if I was fucked, I'd want to go to Aloe. And if you're fucked and you're willing to go to sunny Southern California, I strongly recommend going to Aloe. Good evening, and welcome to the bonus episode of Dopey, the podcast on drugs, addiction, and dumb shit. And I'm Dave, and tonight we have an experimental bonus episode. I was asked by Jen Cutting if I would be on her YouTube channel to interview her for the Dopey show. I agreed, and what you are about to hear sounds like the experiment of Jen Cutting on the Dopey show or Jen Cutting on Dopey, or me interviewing Jen Cutting on her YouTube channel. Either way, pull up a chair, sit back. It's a doozy of a Dopey story. Here we go. So hello and welcome to Dopey via the YouTube channel of Jen Cutting, uh, the podcast on drugs, addiction, and dumb shit. I'm Dave. (laughs) Welcome to the show. Welcome to your show on my show. Right. (laughs) Welcome to our shows. (laughs) How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I, I, I never do video. So like... I know. I'm kind of honored. <laughs> well, it's something that I, I figured I might as well try to do if I'm going to try this stuff. Right. You know, my beard is a little bit longer than I would like it to be. My lighting isn't as nice as your <laughs> lighting, but I, I can live with it. You know, everything is okay. So I have good lighting because thanks to compliments of Jessica. And, you know, it's funny. You don't do video. I've never done a podcast before. So here we are. <laughs> Well, the podcast is so easy to do. You just you just talk, and then you put it out there, and then maybe people will listen. You know, it's right, like uh, right. Same thing with video, though. Like you know, you 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 make it, you post it, and maybe they come to it, maybe they don't. So you know, it's same similar thing. Just uh, one you watch, one you you know listen to. Totally, and uh, and I discovered you through our mutual friend mm-hmm. uh, Jessica Kent, drug addict extraordinaire, prison rights. <laughs> fighter yes. extraordinaire tiktok legend and youtuber yeah. um All and those things. you know and she is a drug addict as am i and as mm-hmm. are you and she Absolutely. said that she used to she used to sell you drugs back mm-hmm. in the day is this true this is very true she was a you know it's funny because everyone's like oh just can't just can't and i'm like yeah she's just my friend like she's just my friend for Oh God, over 12 years, we've known each other. Um, We have pictures together when we were both much younger. I'm 10 years older than her. So she was like a a angry little teenager and I was just a fucked up individual. (laughs) And, you know, we, we, we did dope together. We had a friendship as much as you can have a friendship during that chaotic of a time in your life. And it, you know, we have so many crossovers in our lives. It's, it's insane. We've both had our babies in prison. We both were heroin addicts that switched over to methamphetamine addicts. Um, you know, we both have fought the system. She got her daughter back. I'm in the process of fighting to get mine back. Um, you know, our clean date is a week apart. We just realized that the other day. Like, it's just crazy the similarities that we have in the crossover. I guess we were truly meant to be friends, so... Well, it's nice to have friends and it's nice to to keep relationships. When you Mm -hmm. met her, were you totally addicted? Oh, fuck yeah. Absolutely. I was a raging dope addict. Do you remember what was, tell 
is paint the picture for when you met her in the first place. So, you know, we met through a mutual friend. Um, I was out and I had to go to work and I was like, this is unacceptable. So, you know, you start going through like every person, you know, like, can you get me back? Can you get me back? Can you get me back? Cause I can't be sick at work at the time I was a home health aide. Like that was unacceptable. So randomly some dude, and we both can't remember who it was because that's how insignificant in her lives that they were, was like, yeah, I know this chick. She lives right around the corner from you. And I was like, what? Right around the corner. Okay, let's go. Literally cut, went across the street from my house, cut through two backyards and I was facing her house. And I was like, no way. Walked inside. I'm like, yo, I'm like, what do you got? She was like, what's up? And I was like, what's up? I was like, what do you got? And she was like this. I was like, how much? She was like this. And I was like, here you go. And she was like, okay. And I was like, okay. And that was it. I literally just went in, handed her some cash. She handed me some dope. I went about my day. I assume she went about hers. I don't know. And I don't even know, like, I think a couple of days later, I was like, well, fuck, I don't know where this dude is, but I need some more dope. And I'm pretty sure this chick probably has some. I just went and knocked on her door like, hey, hey, it's me. She was like, what's up, girl? Come on in. And, and she was selling, she was selling heroin. She was selling heroin. It was heroin. But yeah. And was it good? Did she have decent heroin at the time? I mean, I'm pretty sure, yeah, because I don't think I would have went back. I mean, I was getting, I was getting a really shitty deal from the dude I was dealing with, which turns out was her competition at the time, and he was just an asshole. Um, I never went back to him after that because I realized how bad he was ripping me off, you know. And then, just we we just we started to develop a friendship. We were really the only two females around that were really. We still semi had our shit together. You know, we still got up and like took showers and dressed appropriately and, you know, could go out in public where other people, other females we associated with at the time, it was not that case. You know, I and you, were, just, you were working, you were yeah. working. So you had something going, going on, right. For you, luck. Were you, were you, <laughs> you had luck on your side and it was, well, your luck ran out. Your, your, your luck ran out soon after how did you like wind up addicted to heroin in the first place? I like, I like the origin so, stories. Yeah, absolutely. Because here we are, you know, we're two sober people mm-hmm. podcasting and YouTubing mm-hmm. or whatever. But like, obviously, you know, I, I, I always equate it with the Spider-Man origin story. Like Spider-Man got bit by a radioactive, Peter Parker got bit by a right. radioactive spider, blah, 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 blah. You know, I, I remember some dude, showed up at my school with the heroin and I tried it you know what how did it happen mm-hmm. to you so I had oh, well obviously I'm 10 years older so I was in a different part of my life when Jess and I met I had already moved around a lot so I was born in Brooklyn raised in Staten Island I had moved to Long Island while I was living when did you Island, when did you how old were you when you moved to Staten Island uh a newborn I was a newborn okay. <laughs> So you just have to, you can't be say you were born in Staten Island because you don't want to be born in Staten Island. So well, I was born in to... Brooklyn. I was actually born in Mamadi's hospital. And then, okay. you know, three days after they kicked me out of the hospital, I went down to Staten Island where my parents built a home. <laughs> Very nice. And then Cause I, I waited was... tables. I waited tables at Katz's for years. And I found if I said to somebody from Brooklyn, are you from Staten Island? They would be offended. Right. Because they didn't want to be they didn't want to be suspected to be from Staten Island. But if you said to someone from Staten Island, are you from Brooklyn? They didn't get offended. So I find this to be just an interesting New York City. Well, okay, you know why? So 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 most people that live in Staten Island have originated from Brooklyn in one sort of sense or another. So it's like an ancestry type thing, like because my grandma and grandpa lived in Brooklyn. So it was kind of a crossover, like, you know, so you're not offended. But Staten Island is kind of looked at like the prima donna of Brooklyn, maybe. And people get offended, like, I don't live there. Like, you know, they don't want to be like looked down upon. Like, so it's a territory thing. I love it. My my mother in law was born in Brooklyn and also moved to Staten Island. Mm-hmm. And like I I just love the the borough hierarchy. I love like <laughs> people in exactly Staten Island. What it is. I love it. And people in Staten Island want to secede from New York City. It's just <laughs> like yeah, have you never heard about that? It's like for, amazing. For decades though. For decades. So I haven't lived in Staten Island, let's say. So I'm gonna date myself. I graduated high school in nineteen ninety seven. And 
it was a thing back then. It was a loose thing, but it was a thing back then that people wanted to, to, to break away and whatever. So it's been happening for decades because that was decades ago. So when did, when did you, you, you stumble into the world, not necessarily heroin, but when did you like sort of become indoctrinated into the world of, of drugs? Drugs itself. Okay. So I grew up in a very, very strict household, very strict. And I was never allowed to do a thing. I mean, a thing. So literally a few days after I turned 18, I packed a black garbage bag full of my belongings and was like, peace, I'm out and left. Started hanging out with an older guy. I was 18. He was 27. And, you know, he was older. He was cool. And he had cool friends that had drugs. And I did ecstasy for the first time. And I had a love-hate relationship with it. I loved it because I knew I was defying what I was supposed to be doing, but I was uncomfortable with the feeling of it. And it just wasn't my, wasn't my jam, so to speak. And uh, I ended up leaving that relationship about maybe two years into it, and I moved to Florida. I, I randomly had met a friend while I was on vacation with my family during high school. We had stayed in touch the whole time. And uh, I was like, I'm coming. And he was like, cool, I have a spare room. You could be my roommate. And I was like, all right, cool. Uh, I literally moved down there with like nothing. I said, oh, I, I'm going to need a job. <laughs> so he said, well, he said, my, my friend is coming over and his girlfriend, you know, she works at a strip club. They're always looking for cocktail waitresses. So I was like, I can waitress. Sure, I can waitress, no problem. I'm 20 at the time now. Uh, I befriend her. Her name is India. That's not her real name. That was her stage name. And India and I go to the club. It's called the Dollhouse on Orange Blossom Trail in Orlando. It's still there. I recently did a video on my channel about it and everyone was like, yep, still there, still sketchy as fuck. So I went and I applied as a cocktail waitress and I was like, when do I start? And the guy was like, right now. And I was like, oh, cool. All right. So I cocktail waitressed for about like maybe, maybe three, four hours. And I was like, I don't, I'm, I'm making maybe $300. They're making like 1500. Like they don't, they don't, they didn't take off that much. So I'm like, maybe can I, can I do this? Like, am I able to do this? Can I like morally, mentally, subconsciously, like, can I do this? Am I, am I going to be able to go to sleep if I do this? And I was like, yeah, I got this. This is fine. So I started dancing. And then India and I became friendlier and friendlier and friendlier. My 21st birthday came up and she was like, what are you doing for your birthday? And I was like, I don't know. She goes, well, I'm going to request us both off that night. She was like, let's go to the club. Let's, like, it's your 21st birthday, girl. Let's tear that shit up. And I'm like, all right, cool. I'm not really a drinker, but cool. Let's go. One thing leads to another. She picks me up. We stopped at the bar, had a couple of drinks. She said, let's go to my, my boyfriend's house. Let's go pick him up. I'm like, okay. We go in. I sit down on the couch. She goes into his bedroom. A few minutes later, they're like, Jen, come in here. Come in here. And I'm like, oh, God, why are they calling me in here? So I'm, I was more worried that they were going to ask me to participate in something else. I was, like, all nervous. You know, I'm, I'm kind of prudish. You know, I was a good girl and whatever. I walk into the bedroom. They're like, do you want some Coke? And I'm like, to drink? I'm good, thanks. No, I don't know. And they were like, no, do you want to sniff a line? And I'm like, I don't know what you mean. What do you mean? And she was like, cocaine, look here, do you want some cocaine? And I was like, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. What does it do? I don't know. I've never seen it before. Right. Like the only thing I've ever heard about is like in school, don't do drugs. And maybe in the movies I've seen it. Like I've never seen cocaine before. So she's like, well, you know, it's going to make your throat burn. It's going to make your nose run. It's this, but you're going to love it. It's going to be great after a few minutes. At first it sucks, but then you're going to love it. And I'm like, I don't know how she was like, you want a key bump? And I'm like, a what? And she's like, you know, a key bump. And I'm like, uh, she goes, okay. I said, I don't even know how to do this. I don't know. What, what do I do? And she was like, you stick some on the edge of the key, you stick it up to one nostril, you plug the other size and you sniff. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> so I did a key bump and I was like, this is fucking disgusting. She's like, you want some more? And I was like, sure. Marty in this deep, why not? <laughs> the craziest thing about this to me, you're 20? 21, it was my birthday. You're 21, you you basically didn't know what Coke was. You become a stripper on like the draw. I mean, like, how does that happen? Like, were you a good dancer? Had you considered in the back of your head that you were capable of that? Like, how do you turn 21 and then you have your, you do your first Coke and you become a stripper like in the same week? 
How does that happen? Literally in the same week. So like, I don't, I don't know. Do you remember? Like, do you remember? Oh, like, like yesterday. So like, you're like basically like a Disney character. Like <laughs> everything is funny, total innocent. His stage name was Jasmine. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> but like, that's basically the story. And then like, were you like, holy shit, they're opening up this outlaw world to me and I want to take it because obviously at 21, you're a late bloomer. Did you mm-hmm. feel like you had been protected? Did you feel like you had an extended period of innocence and you were like, fuck this, I want to so, try this? I felt jaded. I felt gypped. I felt naive. I felt like I was so restricted. I grew up, so my, my, my family life was not very good uh, as far as, you know, I grew up in a very wealthy family. So it was never, it was not, it wasn't that there wasn't food or we were poor or anything like that. It was not like that at all. My mom has her own mental health issues. Uh, Her and I do not speak as of today. And unless she apologizes, I don't think we ever will. And I'm cool with that. Um, But she's very narcissistic. And I did not know at the time that my experiences in life were fucked up basically. You know, I was very, I had very low self-esteem. Um, I never got to be involved in anything. So I never really knew what it was like to have friendships. Um, I, all I knew was school and I was always made to feel like I was not good enough. Like I was less than I could never, I could be the perfect person in the world and still not live up to my parents' expectations. And and that's still accurate today. Unfortunately, I saw an opportunity and I wanted to fit in so, so badly. And I wanted to make a life for myself by myself down there. So I could potentially, I thought that this was normal and this is what I was lacking in order to be a successful, lovable person in my family's eyes. You know, like that's how that's how skewed my point of view on life was because I never really had any real exposure to anything in life other than what my parents told me. You know, it was all culture shock for me. It was, I look back on it and I literally in the year that I was down there and then the years that progressed, but mainly that first year, everyone's like childhood fuck ups that they had and, you know, kind of teetered with or whatever. I piled like into one year of just a fucking disaster and so give us give us the greatest hits of of, of, okay you're you're 41 we're talking about 20 years ago so the greatest hits of 2001 I, i left like a relationship with an older man i used his credit card to buy my ticket to florida he was not aware i was moving out or we were breaking up he like called me and he's like where are you i was like florida bye and he was like, are you serious? So that was, that was the beginning of it. And I just, you're like you know, cutting, cutting the cord kind of thing. You're like, I'm done. I'm yeah. I just wanted out of Staten Island. Life. I just wanted out of Staten Island and every, that's all anybody wants on Staten Island is to get mm-hmm. off that, get off the island. I'm just kidding. Anyone from Staten Island, Thinking. I apologize. No. <laughs> you can't offend Staten Islanders. They're scary. No, They'll find I, you. My whole childhood is from there. You know, I, I have a love for where I grew up and stuff, you know, and I miss the food horribly because now I live in Nowhereville. But I mean, I think I learned, a, and it's crazy to say, but I learned a lot about myself in that year and those, you know, years afterwards, but I learned how to depend on myself as a female. I learned that sometimes a smile can get you a lot further than like an explanation or it it really, all of that taught me how much of a hustler I really was because I learned, you know, I just, I actually, it's funny. I just did a a video with Jess and I learned what my attributes in life were as a female very, very, very quickly when, you know, I I always had a very low self-esteem. And when I became a stripper, it was literally just for the money. And cause I was going to prove a point. And I then learned you know, you could use your best assets to get you where you need to be. And that transferred over for me, the simple fact that I had a good personality and I was a cute young girl. I learned to use that to my ability in every aspect of my life. Late for rent, smile at your landlord, give him a little look, promise you'll have it tomorrow. Like just, you know, stupid little things like that. And, and I used that for years upon years, instead of actually realizing Yes, that's always helpful, 
but I don't need that because I do have a good brain between my, you know, my ears and I am capable and I am educated and I am intelligent. I thought that in order for me to play in the real world, I had to have this sultry appeal about me. Right. And, and it, it's like we all, I mean, I think most you know, 99% of addicts, like, find a way to manipulate. We oh. find a way to get over. And, like, obviously, I never could strip or particularly <laughs> well. But uh, but you you find your way. And I'm sure, like, the power of being a, a young mm-hmm. woman who, who can do that effectively is real. You know what I mean? It's like very real. Very. So, like, what 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 does that look like? You, you find that you love Coke and that – did you always know that you were capable of dancing? See, that's like, was that, was that, was that a thing or did you learn how to dance on the stage? Okay. So I hated Coke. I fucking hated it. I Me too. I hated, hated it. it. Yeah. I don't yeah, hate I don't it. Know. Like yeah. ugh, I, it was there. So I did it and I don't know uh-huh. why, but now years later it's because I'm a raging drug addict. <laughs> so if there's a drug there, I'm going to do it. <laughs> but you know, no, I didn't know whether I could dance or I couldn't dance because I was not allowed to do things like that. I was not allowed to express myself in ways like that. Maybe when I was like in kindergarten, I was like in tap right. and ballet, but you know, like right. that, that wasn't a thing. Like I wasn't allowed to, that wasn't acceptable. You know, I wasn't even allowed to wear red lipstick because that was a slutty thing to do, you know? So I wasn't allowed to do any of that. So I literally just, I watched the other girls. I watched videos. I'm, I'm a pretty you know, intelligent chick. I'm a fast learner. And I copied and I just made it my own. I mean, years and years into it when I was still dancing, obviously I knew what I was doing, but I was just winging that shit at first. Like I had no clue. Did what your folks not, did your folks know what you were doing in Florida or no? No, they thought I was waitressing. So you were um, like the ultimate fuck you in your mind. Like I'm going to do what I want fuck you. I, I am me. I'm an adult. I'm a grown ass woman, as they say, mm-hmm. which is an expression that I can do without. Um, I'm, a I'm a grown ass, ass woman. Ass, I'm a grown I'm a ass man. I can do what I want to do. Right. Yeah. Um, anyway. Exactly. Um, so like, how does that, like, where does the, the drugs come in? Like you didn't like <laughs> okay. Coke, but you did them anyway. Absolutely. Like what is, what is, what is strip club culture like for a budding young drug addict? So strip club culture is amazing to, um, you know, nurture that type of industry uh, that you're going to grow into. So a strip club culture basically is drug dealers have extra money to spend and they like to look at TNA where are they going without any, you know, repercussions, without any uh, type of anything. So they're, they're coming to the, they're coming to the titty bar. You know, someone's like, hey, let's go get a lap dance. And I'm like, hey, okay, pay, let's go. You know, and he's like, hey, I'm going to do this line real quick. You want a bump? Sure. Or then so-and-so is like, hey, can you bring home a bag? Absolutely. I'm going to get that bag for free and I'm going to come home and I'm still going to charge you for it. And then I'm going to do it with you. So that's, that's like literally the culture of learning. I put myself in a fucked up classroom, if you would. You know, and then I was the young, I was one of the youngest dancers there. It's like get over university. It's like they teach you. I I majored at getting over at get over university. And like you get over Mm -hmm. in every, every situation. It's like, how do I make that situation? And then also it was very obvious, especially to the girls who would speak to me and like help me do my hair and my makeup because they knew I was naive. They knew even though I was now 21 years old, my mentality was not. So I had that innocence with me and the girls would help me. They would tell me, oh, go over, talk to this dude like this or say this like that. Or, you know, this guy, when he comes in, go, don't ask him for a dance. Sit down and talk to him for an hour. I'm telling you, it'll be worth your night. When he gets up and he leaves the table, he'll leave you 500 bucks for sitting with him for an hour and a half. Like, you know what I mean? Like they schooled me. They, they taught me. They took me under their wing, like the little girl that I really truly was. And I learned and I learned quick. I got crazy education that I didn't even realize I was getting at the time that really schooled me into the world of being a hustler because they gave me the foundation for it. No, I think that's amazing. I think that's amazing. Like, like the way we get, we we're basically getting indoctrinated into a world that we didn't really want to get into learning how to, and then all of a sudden we have self-esteem for something that we don't really need self-esteem for and that it will ultimately take everything from Mm -hmm. us. So like, what was, what was the the next chapter down there? Like when did, like, cause then you kind of get some like experience and you're not 
I mean, obviously that's another way to get over also is to be like, I'm innocent, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, you know what's happening. Well, at some point in time, you lose the naivety. Like it goes away. Like it just disappears because you're so exposed to certain things. So after being up there, uh, probably about a year, shit just kept getting worse and worse because now I'm like partying every night. You know, I'm super close to Miami. So after work, there's Miami that shit stays open all day, all night, the clubs. So there's nothing like getting off work at two o'clock in the morning. And, you know, there's some semi-famous guy that's at the strip club and he's like, Hey, let's all go to my condo in Miami. Let's go. You know? And then before you know it, three, four days later, you know, it, it, shit just got out of hand real quick, like real quick. So I have next thing you know, you're living at Pitbull's house. Like and, it and just, Luke I mean, is coming I'd over. Okay. <laughs> but you know, it was just craziness. I was, I didn't even care for ecstasy, but I was constantly doing it. And then I was mad and I'd be doing cocaine to cancel out the ecstasy. And then before you know it, you know, I'd be up for days. Um, K was a huge thing back then. Um, and I do not like that. I used to do GHB all the time. So like I, I've had a, a variety of drugs that I was introduced to that first real year of my jump into you know active addiction and I, I so just, Jen, wait hold up before 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 you say another thing you just mentioned that you used coke ecstasy ghb and ketamine and you hated all of them no so where did no which one did you like i loved ghb i loved that okay. feeling of like relaxation and i never did it okay so it's a very salty weird tasting liquid You know, I would take like a water bottle and fill up the cap and take a water bottle cap full, like the small water bottle caps. And then you would drink it down with some water. But it was a, it was a fucky of a drug. Let me tell you, because if you took a sip too much, you were fucked. You were like in a, in a fucking G box. Like that was it. Like you couldn't, like you could hear people, but you couldn't talk. You felt like you were stuck. You couldn't walk. You couldn't do this. You know, it was just weird. But if you got the right amount down, like I knew I could do a cap and a half throughout the whole night and I was golden. That, that what happened? What happened to GHB? I like, why did people know. stop doing it? Like, what's the story to GHB? I wonder what I don't know. I, maybe people got scared of it because it's a date rape drug, supposedly. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. Like, it made it... Well, what happened with K? Like, is K even still around? Do people even still do it? People are using K, like, in, in weird therapeutic moments now. They're using it, like, for depression and shit. Uh, GHB, like... Yeah, it's weird. They're they're using it as some sort of medication assisted treatment. They're trying right. ketamine trials. Well, I know now, they're doing supposedly. like micro dosing for that. I just didn't know that they were. I don't know enough. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna Same. try to sound smart, and I don't know. Right. But I never got to do GHB. I've heard so many good GHB stories, and then I, I never hear about it again. And I hate to be like, damn, I miss that drug. But damn, I miss that drug. That was a great time for me. Every time, maybe. Oh, I've probably done it. Oh my god. 50 times, maybe three times I had a bad night. I don't know. I just, I really, I really liked it. I don't know why. I know that's so horrible to say, but it's the truth. Um, no, I mean, we like the stuff that makes us feel the way we like yeah, to feel. It just, like I, it, it did. It made me feel good. It made me not think about the things that sucked in my life. Maybe that's it. And so when did, when does heroin show up? So I, okay. So this is the beginning of heroin. So after about a year of being in Florida, I call my dad and I'm like, shit's fucked up. I got to come home. And, you know, he bought me a ticket home and I moved back in with my parents. And for me, and I'm pretty sure every other person in the world can agree with this. If you've never been exposed to this lifestyle before, you kind of are blind to it. You don't really think it exists. But once you've gotten your past, so to speak, into this secret world, it's like you have a key to the club everywhere you go. So now I grew up in Staten Island, right? I have never seen a fucking drug in Staten Island in my life besides like marijuana. I move back home. I go out. I'm like, fuck this. I'm going to make friends. You know, now I'm a party girl. Like now I want to do my thing. So I go... I go to get a tattoo, right? And the dude's like, oh, come out with me and my boys. Come meet us, this, that, and the third. So he calls me up later on that night after he's done, and I go and I meet them. It's like magnets, I swear to you. Once you're exposed to this type of life, no matter where you go, you will always find that culture, always. So immediately he's like, you party? And I'm like, 
fuck yeah, what you got? <laughs> you know, so all of a sudden there's the cocaine. I'm hanging out with this dude. He introduces me some girls that he's friends with. I become fast friends with them. We're partying every week and this is going on probably two, three months. All of a sudden, one night, he's like, oh, look what I got. And he's got a handful of pills. And I'm like, what are those? And he's like, oh, he's like, these are perks. These are Vikes. And I'm like, oh, I never did those before. What, am, what are they, you know, what's that? And he's like, Psh, here you go. And I'm like, oh, okay. He's like, don't do them tonight because you did a bunch of coke. He was like, wait till tomorrow, do them tomorrow. He's like, I'll have a fucking heart attack if you don't. And I'm like, challenge accepted. Okay. <laughs> so I pop a couple, right? And I'm like, oh my God, I really don't feel so good because I probably ate like four or five of them. I don't even know what I ate. My stomach was hurting me, everything. And I was like, oh, maybe I should have listened. So now I'm a little weary of them. I wait like four or five days, right? Something happens. I end up getting stuck home, whatever. And I'm like, oh fuck, I forgot I had these, right? So I go and I take like two. I'm like, I'm going to be real cautious. And I was like, holy shit, these are amazing. This is one drug that I have done that I'm like, I love you. I love you. I cleaned my room, took a shower, organized shit, put my laundry away, had a pleasant conversation with my mother, you know? And I was like, I have found the love of my life. Where have you been? It was Vicodin? It was Vicodin or Percocet? It was like both. I had both. I honestly don't know even what I was doing at the time. I just know the next day I'm like, bro, can you get me some more of those pills? And he was like, yeah, what do you want? You know? And that just started it off for me. Like that, that was the first time, aside from GHB, that I did a drug that I was like, this is fucking outstanding. Every other time I was always like, meh. And from there, I just could not get enough pills possible. So that now- was the, that's the classic I have arrived moment. Yes. Where you're like, this is how I want to feel. I don't want to feel anything All day, besides every this. Day. Yes. From sure. now on, anyone offered me cocaine, I was like, fuck out of here. Right. I don't do cocaine. You know, like anymore. I, <laughs> yes, yes. Cocaine is beneath me. You know, I ended up having a hard time with my parents, of course, because at the time I didn't realize how shitty our relationship was or how horrible my life was with them. And I ended up leaving and I ended up moving to Long Island to go stay with a friend of mine, her and her son. Another time I get to a place and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do good. I'm not going to do drugs anymore. Everything's going to be great. Well, had that, had that been planted in your head, I've gone too far. Like, my mother kept saying like, but you know, it's hard to say because she just always thought I was a shitty human being, but she was like, you're getting worse. You're becoming a worse person in life, you know? And, and, in in all fairness, she was right. I was. You were. But yeah, for how sure. did she notice though? How did she notice? Like, what did she know? She didn't know you were using. Did she know that you were going out? Like, what did she know? She knew I was going out and she would constantly, because I'd be hung over the next day, you know, from doing coke all fucking night long and shit. And she would be worthless. Yes, exactly. And she would constantly be like, you're drinking too much. And I'd be like, bitch, I don't even drink. What are you talking about? Like, and I, so then I would feel justified in being like, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. I don't even drink. If I have a drink, it's the whole night the drink lasts me because I'm too busy doing ripping lines of Coke, you know? So I felt- You just don't tell her that part. Exactly. You just say, I don't right. drink, right? Exactly. I, I don't, you're wrong because I don't drink. You don't know what you're talking about. So that made me feel like I was in my right because she was wrong. I didn't drink. Wait, I have a malfunction yes. in my earring. It's bothering me. Okay. That's okay. So, you know, I, I felt like I was justified to tell her she was wrong because in essence she was, but in essence she wasn't because I was a fucking- worthless blob the next day you know going to bed at five six nine o'clock in the morning trying to get up at 11 like you're just you know fine it's just the weekend I slept in it 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 catches up with you as everybody knows very quickly so I moved down to Long Island and of course I need a job now Long Island transportation is very spotty um as far as busing and I had no clue where I was I didn't know anything I probably if I had to catch a bus I probably would have I don't even know because I knew nothing I wouldn't even know where there was a bus stop I did not have a vehicle at the time uh cabs and on Long Island on Long Island only alcoholics and drug addicts use and use use public transportation or or really poor people like if you look at people at the bus stop they're fucked God bless them. Right. I, I live on Long Island, you know, right. so you moved to where? Huntington? Um, well, when I originally moved out there, I moved to um, like Lindenhurst kind of, West Babylon, like that type of area. 
Okay. So of course, what do I go back to? I said to my girlfriend, I said, so are there any titty bars around here? Any, you know, I'm going to do what I know I'm good at to make a lot of money really quick so I can get on my feet. It's temporary. It's just temporary. I'm just going to do this so I can get a car in my own place. This is what I tell myself. Anytime well, I you dance. also, you get access to drugs, mm -hmm. you get access to self-esteem, you mm -hmm. get access to, to power, and you get to call the shots. You know what Absolutely. I mean? It's like, it's like being a superhero. Like, where do <laughs> I show up to show what I can do? You know what I mean? It's like, it's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Or it's like being, it's either like being a fisherman or it's like being a superhero. It's somewhere in between the two things. Because you have this trade, all you have to do is like, show me the, show me the thing and I'm going to, I'm going to make money and be powerful. So Correct. they find you the spot. They found right. you the spot. So she's like, well, she's like this. There's, I always drive by. There's this local bar on the side of, of the highway, Sunrise Highway. And I'm like, all right, what's it called? She goes, I don't know. She was at work. She was like, I'll look at the name on the way home. She was like, and I'll tell you and you can call there. So she tells me as soon as she gets home, I call and the guy's like, all right, can you come in for an interview tomorrow? And I'm like, absolutely. So I go in. I sit down, I talk to the guy, interview, and he's like, all right, you're hired. And I was like, when do I start? He's like, right now. And I was like, oh, all right, cool. So I start and um, believe it or not, I start working there and he's like, you don't have a ride home. And I was like, no, can you call me a cab? And he was like, I'll just take you home. And I was like, uh -oh. all right, whatever, take me home. So I'm like, he's my boss. I doubt he's going to kill me, right? He's like, you hungry? Let's go to the diner. Let's go eat. So I'm like, all right, cool. I'll go eat. So we go eat. And he's actually Your smoothie like, boss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you'll eat. So we go, we go to the bar, we go to the, uh, the diner and we eat, you know, I remember I got like onion rings and French onion soup. And he was like, do you really like onions? <laughs> I was like, I guess so. And at the time I hated them. So he's very nice to me. He's like, I'll pick you up for work tomorrow. And I was like, all right, cool. That, that was, you know, it would put less stress on my friend for her having to feel like she has to take me to work and stuff. So I'm naive to the fact, I guess, that he's totally hitting on me. I think he's just being nice. So a few weeks go by, a few months go by. Now there's like talk around the bar at night, like and a couple of customers are like, are you so-and-so's girl? Like, are you the owner's girl? You know, or people are be like, I'm, I want to take the owner's girlfriend in, in the lap dance room. So it's like working out in my benefit. Like I'm making much more money because people always want other people's things in situations like that. Right. Okay. And so, the prestige, the prestige of you being connected with the owner to everybody else. Right. And I think also people just wanted to be like, Hmm, I got to lap dance with your girl. You know what I mean? Like, it's just a. Right. Fuck a with them. Thing. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So all of a sudden we really do start hanging out. Like I was off one weekend. He's like, well, you're off this weekend for like the first time ever. He's like, I'll take the weekend off. He's like, let's go to Mohegan Sun. And I'm like, don't threaten me, but a good time. Let's go. I'm always down to go. So we go and we do, we end up hooking up and then we end up actually getting very deeply involved in a relationship and we end up living together. We were actually engaged for a while too. So I danced for him for probably about a year. Um, at the time it was just a bikini bar. As soon as it was about to go topless, like he had applied for the, for the um, licensing to go topless, I got sick. I had to have my appendix out. And I was not prepared. I had never had surgery or anything before. I was not prepared for like recovery time. So I was in a hurry to try and come back. And he kept like postponing it. Like, wait till you go to the doctor. Wait this. He just didn't want me to work there anymore. Like he was starting to get territorial, especially because it was about to become a topless bar. So okay, whatever. I come back to work. I don't tell him I'm coming back for that shift. I just show up. And he's like, absolutely not downstairs. And I'm like, okay. Cause his office was downstairs. I go inside. He's like, you're fired. Let's get married. And I'm like, what? You can't, this, this is how you met me. You can't fire me. You can't change me, <laughs> you know? And the crazy part is the entire time I'm like doing cocaine behind his back because it's at the bar. I'm actually doing less cocaine. I'm only doing it because I'm working so many nights because I'm tired, but pills now I have a way bigger access to them. Um, I have a guy who's actually one of my customers who was giving me bottles at a time. 
So now, you know, I'm giving him like 50. Tipping you with bottles, paying you with bottles. Like, did that become part of the currency? Like you dance Mm -hmm. and they give you a prescription. They give you 200 Mm -hmm. pills or whatever, 50 pills. And he doesn't know your, your, your owner boyfriend doesn't know. He knows I'm eating pills, but he thinks like on, on Sundays when he's off, him and I will sit down, eat a bunch of pills together, go out to dinner, have some wine. You know what I mean? Like, so he thinks it's like a date night thing. We're doing it together. It's like a daily fucking thing for me. Like I first, so then I go to the doctor and I complain my back bothers me. Oh, sure. You want a script for fucking Viking and 10? Here you go. And the doctor writes me, you know, so now I, not only am I getting what I'm getting on the street from these dudes and occasionally whatever me and my man are doing, I'm also getting a monthly prescription. So I'm probably eating 25, 30 pills a day, you know, throughout the day. Then one of the girls at the club taught me because my stomach started bothering me. You can crush them up and sniff them. So then I was like, woohoo, I love to sniff things. Let's go. (laughs) So then, you know, now it's even worse because now, you know, I still to this day sniffle because of all the drugs I've sniffed in my life. So it just progressively got worse and worse. Like, did you ever run out? Did you ever run out of pills? Did you ever realize you had a habit? I ran out and I called the doctor like, hey, bro, can you hook me up with a refill? And they were like, he's on vacation. And I was like, I need my medicine. And they were like, you're sick you need to go into rehab. And I said, rehab, that's for like old white men. What do you mean rehab? I'm, I'm, I'm young. I don't need rehab. That's for people rehab. Like I was totally offended that they wanted to send me to old white man place. So I had no, I'm I'm offended that you're, you're slandering rehab as an old white man place, but no, keep going. Then that's literally how I viewed it. Like that's how naive I was, you know? And so yeah, now I place people in rehab. (laughs) I'm like, go to rehab, get the tools you need. But, you know, so I I just, I finally realized like, this is not good. Like I'm sick, like I'm sick. So one thing led to another. I finally, of course, got a couple of pills and, and did not understand the correlation between the two of them, that this is why I'm sick. And this is what's making me sick, but in the same sense, it's making me better because I need more to not be sick. Like I didn't, I didn't know any of that stuff yet. I still was so. You didn't realize, you didn't realize that you were, you didn't realize you were a drug addict. You didn't realize that you were addicted to fucking So back then a drug addict to me was like a crack addict or someone using needles, you know, like those types of things, like eating pills that the pharmacy makes is not bad. Like it's, it's made by a doctor. Like you have a prescription. It's okay. You know, I was so naive to addiction. It it blows my mind now that I look back and I'm like, damn, you were dumb, but I didn't know. What what, what blows my mind is because I was just thinking, I was just listening to your story and thinking about like, you know, I, I very rarely went to get pills, you know, and, and, but whenever I did, I could get them. Like if I went to the doctor and I wanted pills, it was very easy to get pills. Mm-hmm. Um, what's amazing is that now that's kind of changed. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like that the world has changed because of people like us, basically, right. you know, like, we I just think it. that's, inc- well, it's incredible that they didn't. Re- I mean, you say you didn't recognize yourself as an addict. I think even doctors who knew they were prescribing dangerous substances didn't see their patients as full on drug addicts, which is part of the problem. Or maybe mm-hmm. they just saw them as a means to get money. Um, either way, mm-hmm. it's like, it was a, it was a naive era. It was before like all this big pharma shit came out at all. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. I think it's pretty amazing. Um, and, and, and so like you're realizing you're ha- you have a habit, you're realizing mm-hmm. that you're dependent and, yeah. um, and you're realizing probably that you have a tolerance that you need to oh. be using so much more. Right. Yes. Yes. So during this time, shit started to really fall apart between me and the owner guy, right? He's like, you need to stop. T-. Like, he now realizes I'm sick and that I, he must start looking at my prescription. This is the only thing I can think of. He must start looking at his prescription because he, you know, starts making comments and saying things like, you have a problem, you need to slow down. So things get to the point that they're so bad. He ends up cheating. I end up losing my mind. I call my parents who have then moved to Delaware County where I live now in New York. And I'm like, 
I'm coming home. <laughs> Anything's got to be better than this. I, I was honest. I told my parents, like, I have a problem. I need help. This, that, and the third, because my life was so fucking out of control. I move home. Did he cheat on you with another stripper? Yes. Terrible. But I guess I that's mean, the perks on. of owning a strip club. Yeah, yeah. Like, anyway. whoa. Yeah. Okay. I, mean, so I, needed, I, need, I needed to satisfy I mean, that question. A blind internal. person could have wrote yeah. that chapter in the book. I mean, come but on. Come he on. He had a plan. He had his, that was his setup. Yeah. But you were going to be his wife. Yeah. You were going to oh, be yeah. the owner, the, the strip club owner's wife. Yeah, anyway, probably continue. with like a really small leash on life of what I was allowed to do. That wouldn't have worked for me. So I moved these home. Are, these are <laughs> these are these are choices we didn't take. So you Correct. get to Delaware County, Correct. you have a you have a pill habit. Yes, I have a pill habit. So I my believe it or not, my parents actually I think for the first time in my life, they actually stepped up and were like, we're going to help you. Like, we're really going to go through this with you. My mom called the drug and alcohol outpatient place, made an appointment for me. She had a couple of volumes. You know, when I got there, she gave me one to help me detox because she Googled it, you know, and it genuinely did help. I mean, as we all know, that definitely helps, you know, and I came the day before Christmas in 2005. So for like two weeks, I was kind of on my own because of the holiday. And my parents really did their best to support me and help me and get me to a place of sobriety. And for about three months, it worked. And I went to my little outpatient appointments and said, everything is fine. I don't know why I'm here. Yes, I was just experimenting. You know, I didn't, there was no... um, I wasn't done. I wasn't done. And there was no, I just didn't see it for what it really was. It was a fun time. I was being a kid. I was doing what I was supposed to in my eyes. Mm -hmm. And I befriended some girl and she had mentioned, I don't know why, just randomly that she had pills. So of course I'm like, you know, and we, we start becoming friendlier and friendlier. And I call her one, I, I, oh, so I know that this girl has pills, right? I go one day into my parents' bathroom. I don't know why, maybe toilet paper, who the hell knows? And for some reason, I look in my, the medicine chest. I don't know why. My dad, thank God now, he is in remission, but he had cancer at the time. He cannot take painkillers. He has bad allergic reactions to them. It's so odd. I'm a junkie and he can't take them. (laughs) Go figure. So there's, you know, those big old pill bottles, like the biggest of the biggest bottle that they have filled with Vicodin 10s. And I'm like, oh my God, is this a gift? (laughs) Was this sent here for me? So I'm like, it's been months. I'm fine. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. This is, this is too good to me. (laughs) You're, you, you, you get to Delaware County you're basically strung out your mother helps you like walks you through it and you're like okay I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do this at what point do you go into your father's medicine cabinet and find the crazy bottle of pills like how far after that so I came there basically in January because it was right before Christmas right maybe March April because I remember it was warm out so what was the, I mean, like that shit would fuck me up. Like, I, like, I opened, would think it was, I would think it was the greatest, right. Like I opened the cabinet, closed the cabinet, looked around. Like I remember, like my memory is not so great because of all the drugs afterwards, but there are certain things that are so pivotal in my mind. It's insane. And like, I opened it, I looked, at, looked out the door. Is anybody coming in? Like, am I being set up? What is happening? I open it up. I look at it and I'm like, oh my God, look at all these fucking whole bottle I put it back in I walk over to the toilet I pee I go back over I look at it again you know like like is this a gift (laughs) I can this is this is this is God's way of testing me that I'm Mm. strong enough to just do a few and walk away literally like this is that was the story my addiction is like bitch eat them pills (laughs) so of course I take a couple I'm like whoa I feel amazing. This is great. Oh God, I missed this. Literally for like the next couple of days, I, every couple of hours, you know, I'm hitting them up, hitting them up, hitting them up. There's only like 180 pills in there. All of a sudden I go in one morning and there's like two pills left. So I eat them, of course. And I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do with this bottle? I'm like, I'm going to put it in the trunk of my car. Like nobody's going to look there. This is fine. This is 
fine. No one's going to notice there's a fucking gaping hole in all the stuff that's lined up in the cabinet. When my father opens his medicine chest, he's not going to notice this ginormous bottle just gone. I, I don't know. I didn't see it. What are you talking about? You know, I'm, I'm innocent. So of course, you know, I've been fucking down in pills like it's my job in life for four or five days. And now I have none. I know what comes next. I've been down this road before. I am going to be sick as a motherfucking dog. So I call the girl up. Doot, doot. I'm like, hey, remember me? <laughs> Hi. Do you have them pills? And she's like, no, I'm out. She's like, I've been out. And I was like, you have got to fucking be kidding me. She goes, but I know this dude. He lives over in Franklin. And I'm like, all right. I'm like, here's my number. Tell him to call me. She's like, okay. She's like, here's his number too. He'll be cool. Just call him. You know, tell him we're friends. I sent you. So I'm like, all right. I call this guy. I call this guy. Nothing, 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 nothing. He finally calls me back. I don't get the call. I call him back. He doesn't get the call. So finally, I'm like stalking this guy, right? I finally get him on the phone. And he's like, yeah. He's like, I'm home now. He's like, come through. He's like, you're going to have to take me to go pick them up though. And I'm like, I got you. No problem. I'll be right there. I go, I pick him up. Were you sick? I was starting to be, yeah. I, I remember not feeling good. Like after like 45 minutes of like, because by the time I traveled to the next town over, found his house, got him, went there. Like it's been like, two days where I like probably ate a half a pill, ate a half a pill, you right. know, because I knew what was going to come. So I'm feeling mm-hmm. pretty, I'm feeling pretty green. So mm-hmm. I finally get him. We go, we pick up. He's like, listen, he's like, I can't get you Vicodins. He's like, I can't get you Hydro. He's like, but I can get you Oxys. So I'm like, mm. what's that? And he's like, just a stronger pill. You won't need as much. And I'm like, okay, let me get them. Perfect. Yeah, this works for me. So I'm like, so I crush one up, I snort one up, and I was like, holy fuck, this is even better. Like, look at my life changing for the better. So after probably, now, of course, I start hanging out with this dude all the time. I really don't know anybody in the area except for this chick that hooked me up with this dude and like him and the people he's introducing me to. So he and I start hanging out, hanging out, hanging out, hooking up, hanging out, whatever. Now it's like three months into it. Okay. I'm eating pills every day. I'm right back where I started probably even worse because now I'm eating oxys, you know, and whatever the case may be. Now, every time we go pick up, he gets his, but he doesn't do his in front of me. I'm like, all right, cool. I don't know. Whatever. That's his thing. I'm going right in the bathroom, crushing them shits up, taking the coating off. I'm doing them up. All of a sudden it's time to go pick up one day. We drive around for hours trying to find something. I can't find a crumb, nothing, nothing. All of a sudden, you know, like this is not good. Like I'm sick. I'm fucking sick. I'm in the bathroom. We go back to, I'm like, we have to go back to your house. Like I have to go to the bathroom. We have to go back to your house. We go back to his house. He and his brother stayed in the basement of his parents' home. So I go downstairs to go in the basement to go to the bathroom because I want to be alone because I know I'm about to be sick. I'm sick. I'm probably in there for like half hour, 40 minutes. And finally he's like, knock, knock. He's like, are you all right? And I was like, no, I'm dying. I'm fucking dying. And he is like, all right. He's like, well, he's like, I don't know what to do. He was like, I can't find anything for you. And I'm like, I, I, I okay. I don't know. Like I, I'm sick. Can you go away? You know, so then probably another 20, 25 minutes later, he comes back and he's like, listen, Jen, he was like, I'm going to come in. And I'm like, the fuck you are. And he's like, I'm coming in. And I'm like, oh, it's not like I could get up and, you know, keep him out. So he comes in and he's like, listen, he's like, I have something really serious to tell you. He's like, I have something. He's like, it will take, you will be fine. You will not be sick. He's like, but you know, he's like, it's something my brother and I did earlier. He's like, and I have a little bit left over. So I'm like, go fucking get it. Like what? Like I'm dying. Go get it. So he comes downstairs and he like takes out. And you had no idea. You had no idea what he was going to come with. It didn't occur to you. And all this time you're using every, basically every opiate under the sun that isn't heroin and dilaudid and fentanyl. And like, and he's, but but, but it's like a mystery to you. That's amazing. I have never even seen heroin. Right. I, I didn't, I just knew like, I was under the assumption in life that all heroin looked like black tar because that's what I saw on TV. I didn't, I, I, Mm. you know, it's crazy. I was so, um, worldly in a sense, but so naive in the same, same aspect of everything that was going on in my life. It's craziness. 
So all of a sudden he takes out of his pocket, he takes a rig out, he takes a spoon and I'm like, the fuck is that? What? What is that? And he's like, well, he's like, if I use this cotton, scrape this spoon, use the same needle because there'll be residue in it. He's like, because you've never done it before, you will not be sick. Like, it'll be just enough that you will not be sick and you'll feel good. And I was like, fuck out of here. Absolutely not. No way. He's like, all right, fine. So he leaves everything on the floor and he leaves the bathroom. 20 minutes later, he's like, knock, knock. Now I'm like ready to die. Like, I think I'm, I'm probably dehydrated. I'm, I probably puked and shit every ounce of hydration in my entire body. Right. I'm hot, cold, sweating, the whole, you know, the whole gamut. Like I'm dying, fucking dying. He's like, are you okay? And I was like, come in. And he came in and I was like, just fucking do it. Hurry up. And then I was like, holy fuck you know the whole thing but there was nothing in it there was nothing in the spoon it was it was it was was a cotton shot it was like a cotton shot but like that's amazing to me also like the way like a cotton shot will like bring you back to life Mm -hmm. and then probably you know six weeks later you would never feel it right never like it was because it was my first touch of it and it was so powerful to me like you know, for me, that was like a pivotal point. Like I, I finally understood some things. I finally understood why people shut up first off, because even though it was a tiny cotton shot, I had never been exposed to it before. And I literally felt the feeling, you know, like I tasted it. I felt it come up my throat. I felt the whole effect that happens. And it was like, I was healed. I, I could get up. I could walk. I could, you know, not no, I think it's crazy. It's like a video game. It's like that. It's like mm-hmm. you're dying and then you, you take the thing that restores you to full health yeah. and you have energy. And it's like, it's crazy. It's like, it's something that I, I still, I struggle with that. I mean, like, I'm not tempted to use or anything, but that right. phenomena of feeling like you have nothing, mm-hmm. no way to live. And then you take a little bit of something and you feel and you better than you've ever felt and you have strength and everything. Mm-hmm. So how long did you ride the wave of that first cotton shot? Did you? Like how long probably, did you, you know, well. I felt amazing. And I, so right after that, he was like, are you better? And I was like, yeah, I was like, can I borrow a shirt? Cause I've been sweating, like, you know, gross, just being sick. And he was like, do you want to eat something? Like drink some water. Like you look rough, like drink some water. I drank some water. I ate some food. I felt like a human being for the first time in a while. I think through that night I felt okay. And then he was like, listen, he was like, are you going to sleep over? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, uh, can we go pick up for the morning? And I'm like, can you find, cause I'm still, can you find me pills? You know, I don't know how to do that stuff. I don't even know what he did. Really. So I was fine. We went and picked up that night. I thought I was still going to get pills. He still couldn't find any pills. So I was like, all right, just get me one, one bag. Cause you know, he explained to me how it came and I was like, just get me one. That's all I need is just one. I'm thinking like, in my mind, I, th- I think what I was thinking, like bag sounds really big, right? You don't think a bag is like, you know, so for me, I'm thinking, oh, well, if it's a bag of something, I, I could use it often. So he tells me, you know, like, no, you, you probably, for you, you could probably use a bag two or three times because you know, you're not really used to it or whatever. And I'm like two or three times how big is this bag like I'm again I'm thinking bag so he's like shows me and I'm like that's not a bag that's not a bag and he's like that's a bag of dope that's a bag and I'm like so this is heroin is that what this is and he's like yes like yes so it's a crazy crazy it's like it must be crazy for you to look back at it now um because of everything that happened and how naive you were I remember for myself like it took me, I mean, I was addicted to heroin for many, many years and it took me many, many years to realize that there would never be enough. You know what I mean? Like it's such, it's such a strange thing. So you're like thinking you're going to get a big bag, but even a little bag in the beginning is it's like, it, yeah, it's a gigantic bag in the beginning. A bag is a night, a night in a morning mm-hmm. in the beginning, but that yeah. doesn't last. No. So like, where were you making money in Delaware County? Like, how are you going to support this habit? Was there a strip club in Delaware County? No. Or God, you wouldn't want there to be. <laughs> to be you wouldn't. Up. You definitely wouldn't. It's not. I, so, so no. So I'm at this time, I'm doing my home healthy thing. You know, I'm getting a little bit of money here because I lived with the guy who owned the club for a very long time. My money was all my money. 
He paid the rent. He paid the car insurance. He paid to this. He paid like so you still had money. I had money. I mean, I didn't have long money, but I had money. I had money enough at the time. I had no children, no real responsibilities. I, my, I had a, like a, a knee. I drove a neon. So it was bought and paid for cash. I had no car payment. Um, my insurance, I had like paid for the year because, you know, back then liability was like two, $300 for the year. All I had was like a cell phone and gas money. So I had money to burn. So I had money. Um, I, I went through it very quickly because he did not have money. Right. And then he saved your ass. So you had to save his ass basically. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and as soon as, as soon as you started buying uh, bags or even the first bag, were you shooting immediately because you shot, because he shot you up or were you sniffing? You shot immediately. It was done. Mm-hmm. The genie was out of the bottle. Oh, absolutely. Because I snipped it like the next morning. I was like, oh, I'll just snip this. And then I was like, the fuck is that? Like, it's not the same. I was immediately, like, I I was a heroin addict the first time. You were immediately addicted to injecting it the second you injected it, which is what happens to people. Yeah, Absolutely. So my thing, my whole, after that, you know, my, I was a heroin addict for very long time but I was also a needle act addict for a very long time you know nothing got me off like that and and that's what happened like I was constantly chasing that dragon for the rest of my days until 2009 when I got sober from heroin like that was that was that was my jam I was all about it and if I had to sniff it I was a miserable bitch behind it Because there were times, you know, it wasn't appropriate. I had to travel somewhere with family and I couldn't bring a rig with me or my rig was dull. So I had no choice or I couldn't get a, you know, there were times I had to sniff it and I was miserable because I didn't get my two loves in one, you know, dose. No, I get it. And I think you described it really well. The phenomenon of, of injecting heroin is, is major. It hits you. It hits, mm-hmm. a, it hits a lot of weird things at the same time. First time I did it, I didn't love it. First time I did it, it was too much. I think I OD'd the first time I did it. I, had, I was seeing a girl and she shot me up and I, and I didn't, it was the first time we ever hung out and we only hung out because I knew she had dope. Right. And, she, and it's kind of like a similar story, but I had dope. I was just sniffing it for years. I wasn't interested in shooting it up. And she came mm-hmm. to my apartment and uh, it was the first time I ever shot up and she shot me up and I went out, you know, I just went out and she mm-hmm. had to drag me into the bathtub. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And it was just, the, and I'm pretty big and she had, it was just crazy. She beat the shit out of me and woke me back up. And I My wasn't God. interested in shooting again until uh, it was about the money. And then some dude, uh, I left detox with a guy and he was like, you're a fucking idiot that you don't shoot up. And I <laughs> didn't have a job. I think I was on unemployment and, uh, and like it had to go the other way. And once I shot up with him, I never didn't shoot up again. Yeah. Um, but what was the, um, what, wh- what happened to your life at that point? You know what I mean? Like you, so you, you immediately I, have the habit. Yeah. yeah. And he and I blew through my money dumb quick, you know, now, now I'm a full fledged heroin addict. He's been for a God only knows how his years, decades. I mean, probably since he was early teens, he's been doing dope. And at this time we're like mid twenties. So he's, he's, he's got a decade behind him of of use. So it's nothing for him to shoot a bundle shot, you know, and here I am thinking I'm big shit because I'm shooting a bag at a time. So that went real quick. I, I mean, at the height of it, we were probably picking up four or five bundles at a time, all out of my bank account. So what happens next? You progress to being broke and committing crimes. So literally I'm in the bathroom at Walmart shooting up, right? Because I'm sick and we managed to pick up one bag. He fucking steals some bitch's purse out of her, out of her cart. I come out of the bathroom. He's walking up to me. He hands me this chick's purse. So my man hands me something. I'm like, Oh, okay. I grab it. I'm like, what the fuck is this? And he's like, take the wallet out. So I'm like, all right. I open up, I take the wallet out, I hand him back to the purse. He walks, he takes the purse and walks over to the garbage can, throws the purse in the garbage can. He's like 15 feet away from me, throwing the purse in the garbage can. I'm standing there holding this lady's wallet. All of a sudden, Walmart security comes right up to me. He takes off out the door and here I am holding this chick's wallet. I truly don't even, I'm starting to be like, uh, and they were like, where'd you get that? And I was like, uh, uh, and they were like, let's go. And they take me into their security office. They take off after him. They end up catching him, but here I am in the security office. We call state troopers. I've never been in trouble. 
I don't know what's happening. I have a rig in my pocket. Like it's bad, you know, uh, it's bad. It's bad. It's like, it's like, and the, the crazy thing again is like the scope of the story. You were the innocent Disney princess in Orlando. And now you're fucking shooting up the one bag at Walmart, holding some lady's wallet. Like, yeah. how did this happen? Yeah, well, it's like, and, and it's like at that point, is that the moment when you're like, oh shit, I'm a hopeless junkie and I'm stealing this woman's wallet at Walmart? No. And and like, okay, no. no, what were you thinking? What was the, what was on your mind? Fuck, uh, I, I was scared. I was scared. I, can, I was, you were in full on denial the whole time. Yeah, like, I can't my parents are going to be life. so mad at me. I get arrested on grand larceny. I get a $5,000 bail. My parents make me sit there for like four or five days until they bail me out. And you know, then it's- You're sick. I'm sick as fuck. I'm sick. I'm detoxing like crazy. I'm begging my parents. They're telling me, you're going to have to sign this paper. We're putting you in rehab. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. They could have told me I had to chop my nose off. Okay, okay. I know, I know. I have pills hidden in my winter jacket in my parents' closet, in my house. So at this point, I would have promised my left arm if they told me I had to. So whatever they said, I'm like, okay, okay. I couldn't wait to get home. As soon as we got home, I said to my mom, I'm going to go change because I wanted like privacy. You know, I figured she wouldn't come in. I reached in, there was like four Vicodin fives in there. I ate them, like chewed them, ate them. And I had some sort of relief, but it was next to nothing. And they were like, tomorrow you're going to the outpatient we're signing you into rehab this and I'm like okay okay whatever I managed to like postpone getting signed into the rehab getting signed into the rehab because I manipulated the counselor as much as I possibly could and at the time Seth ended up getting out as well and he came you know I had to go into the rehab he brought me pills while I was in there you know he hooked me up he took care of me um We ended up getting sentenced. I got a one to three. It was my first time being incarcerated. I got a one to three. I don't know what he got. I'm assuming around the same thing. After that, you know, I saw him once or twice at parole. I was decided, you know, I was scared after that. I was going to do the right thing. I was going to stay on the straight and narrow. I was on parole. He continued to get high when he got home and we kind of went separate ways and I never really saw him except for occasionally, you know, we'd run into each other or whatever, but he went down a much darker path and, uh, his addiction, he actually ended up committing suicide. His addiction. Oh man. Yeah. Sadly. Um, I truly had love for him and he's such an intricate part of my life and it's, I wish I knew then what I know now, and maybe I could have made some sort of I'm so sorry. It's such a terrible thing. Um, But you guys were like dumb kids. Mm -hmm. You didn't know the stakes. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. Didn't know the stakes. And like this poor kid, like, you know, it breaks my heart. Obviously, like, I've been around a bunch of people who have been, you know, Mm -hmm. killed over this thing. And it's... I guess it's not that crazy a leap from overdosing to suicide. It's, it's, it's the same, the same ballpark, I think. And I'm sorry that happened. Yeah, Um, I am too. There's no way you can make sense of it. He couldn't live with it. He didn't want to live with it anymore and he couldn't get out of it. And he tried like hell to get help. But unfortunately where I live, help is becoming a thing now, but it wasn't then. And he asked for help and he couldn't get it. In a lot of ways, it wasn't. It isn't now too, because people want help, and the the help doesn't work. You know, I know what I mean? Like, it's it's a magical thing that happens if help works. It's a magical thing that happens it if is. it clicks right in your head. You know, um, I know it, I I didn't have a chance, and it was a magical thing that I got out of it. Um, so when you got out of jail the first time, like, how long did you stay on the straight and narrow for parole? <laughs> I completed parole. You know, I was scared. I didn't want to go back to prison. I, I, nobody wants to go back. I stayed on parole for a year. I completed after a year for good behavior and yada, yada, yada. And, um, I completed parole. I want to say like December or January or whatever, you know, like later that part of the year. And by March, I was already back at it. 
And that's actually when I met Jess. So I, I moved into Sydney. I got my own place, moved into Sydney. I was working, I was working at home as a home health aide. And I moved into Sydney. I got my own place. And that's within maybe April, May of that year. So that would have been 2009. I met Jess. And, and did you go, did you get, did you get busted again? Yes. How did you get busted again? I was stealing from my job and somebody kind of, somebody else, somebody else, I've been snitched on several times in life. Um, so I was dealing with this girl who ended up getting questioned for something else who she ended up getting incarcerated for too, but to try and make hers not, uh, you know, hit as hard as it did. She threw me under the bus. Uh, the state trooper actually told me like, you know, so-and-so told me about this because it was the perfect crime. Nobody would have known. I was working uh, as a home health aide and I found a safe underneath a bed and uh, it was open. So I took the money. And what was, how much money was in there? Oh, enough. I think like, when like, I got arrested, they, they were wrong with their figure. I think they had me down for like eight or 10 grand and they were way off. Right. Were you, were you just like terrified or were you like, fuck it, this is going to, this is going to pay for my life. Or were you like, were you scared of going back in? You weren't scared of going back in. I was the one who seemingly had their shit together. I still had a job. Once I confided in people and said, yeah, like I get high, they'd be like, you do? I don't even think you do. So I was in that I'm invincible type of, I got this shit. Like, and you I had a like, habit the whole way through. Did you use way. a lot? Did you, lose, did you use a lot when you were doing your first bit in jail? No, no, I didn't use at all. I didn't even see drugs my first bit in jail. But then again, here I am completely out of my element. I'm only 20 something years old. And I just, it wasn't jail back then was like camp. It was, I, I, people get pissy when I say that, but I'm not going to lie. Like jail wasn't a scary place. What was scary was intake day, you know, having a cough and squat. That shit was, you know, demeaning. It was scary. Not understanding, you know, some of the dynamics or, you know, the culture of jail. That was scary. After being there a couple of weeks, it wasn't scary. We had movie night. We had Netflix, you know, like back then you used to get like a blockbuster and, and you would have a movie to watch on Friday nights and everyone would sit out in the day room with their snacks. And I learned how to play spades and it wasn't, it wasn't scary I didn't have you know this last time was a lot different because I'm a mother and I actually had something to lose did you the first time no did you did you figure out that you could live without dope was it like holy shit I'm not doing dope and and like was it like a like a a template to know not an epiphany not an epiphany but just like when you get busted the second time or you have to figure out how to live without drugs you're like wait I did it the first time I had done this already or or it was nothing it was nothing it It didn't even register it was nothing right you know and then when I came home so actually Jess ended up taking me to court the day that I had to like go and get sentenced and stuff. And I parlayed it. It was a three to six because I was a second felony offender now, you know, so I got sentenced to a three to six and I parlayed it into Willard, which is only a 97 day boot camp treatment thingy. And I did that. And when I came home, Jess was already on the run. Um, so, you know, that was gone. And I went home to my parents cause I had nowhere else to go because Jess and I were living together at the time and that apartment was gone. So, I got my shit together because I had to go to my parents. And that's when I ended up getting pregnant with my daughter. I got pregnant with my daughter in April. So I hadn't, since I had been incarcerated, you know, in the end of 2009, when I came home in 10, I got pregnant with with my daughter and I never picked up heroin ever again. Wow. So like the getting off of heroin was almost just like, like a, a side effect of the course yeah. of your life. It wasn't a decision. It no. just sort of happened that way. It That's was not a decision. It was never a decision. I never said, like, I remember at one point in time, I was real deep into it. And when I was living in Sydney and I, you know, first met Jess and stuff. And I remember saying to myself one day, like, all right, you have to cut back. Like your clothes don't look as good on you. Like, like it was more of like a conceit type of thing. And I was like, all right, I made myself a schedule. Like, on these, like for lunch every day for the next two weeks, you're going to eat a peanut butter sandwich because I was losing weight and I was starting to look bad and I didn't want to look bad. 
at one point in time, I said, like, I need to slow down because I realized that I was looking shitty and I needed to slow down and I needed to maintain who I was. But the only reason why I quit heroin was because, well, prison. And then I got pregnant and I had already had sobriety because I had been incarcerated and I had done the Willard program. So once I got pregnant, it wasn't like I had to go through withdrawal and detox and all that. I was already, I was already past all that. So. Well, how did you, cause you have this real passion for recovery now. You work with people with addicts, you, you're all about Narcan, you're all about helping mm-hmm. addicts. When did that, when, when, cause like you basically went through your drug addiction and your life kind of in denial of your drug addiction and the, the sort of scope that drugs played in your life, like in a bigger way, like where drugs and and stripping and all that shit supplanted your self-esteem and it created an identity and it created connections and community and all that shit that we get in other places when we're not using. Like, when did it hit you that you could be this force for sobriety, for recovery, for all that stuff? Okay, so once I was pregnant, I, I, I wanted to, I never wanted a child. And I never thought I was ever going to have one. So it was kind of like, well, fuck, now what? You know? And I ended up getting a violation, a curfew violation, and absconding while pregnant with my daughter's father because he was on parole too. And I didn't know whatever. So I got 18 months. I had my daughter in Bedford Hills Correctional Facility. And once I came home, I was so in love with my Holy shit. Hold up, though. So you're you're pregnant. You get picked up for being out with your... Baby's father on parole. Yeah. Late. Yeah, I don't. I, 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 if I say baby daddy, it sounds much different. <laughs> baby I got daddy. You. Um, baby anyway, daddy. and um, and they lock you up and you give birth in prison, yes. just like your dear friend Jess yes. did. And you didn't know that at that point, right? We were actually pregnant at the same time and incarcerated at the same time. My daughter is six months older than than Jessica's daughter. So you had to go through it six months before she did. In a completely different situation. She got treated like an animal. I would not wish that In Arkansas. on anyone. Yes. My birthing experience as an inmate sucked, but not, not anywhere near as to what my poor friend went through. And I got to keep my daughter. So that's a huge... You know, Bella stayed with me in the nursery for the entire time. We left together in February of 2013. And, you know, I went home and I was like, I love my baby and I want to do the right thing. And I want to show her struggle is a part of life. Absolutely. But it doesn't have to be the only way of life. So in a sense, my daughter gave me life. And... I did not, I did not um, do the things that I needed to do to stay sober. What happened then? Like what, what, what went wrong at that point? And I don't judge you. I was still using when my daughter was, uh, was, you know, up till age of four or five or something like I, you know, I didn't have custody. I was fighting for custody and I was using, and you know, if I could do it over again, I would, what was, what was your deal? So Bella was very small, her biological father. uh, I actually did a whole YouTube video about this. So her biological father committed suicide. He was mentally unstable and he committed suicide. So I had a lot of pressure because I was the only parent in her life. So much suicide. I'm so sorry. It's so terrible. You know, it really it's... is. It truly is. And unfortunately, one day when my baby is old enough, because she's only nine, I will have to have the most detrimental conversation of her life with her to explain to her what really happened, because she just thinks he got sick and went to heaven. But well, he did. I mean, that's true. Yes, also, yes, you know? exactly. That's why I was OK with explaining it to her at such a young age that she was you know, curious about it to know she wanted to know why she didn't have a daddy. So, you know, and so when he died, when he died, were you using? No, he was, but I was not. We had nothing to do with each other. I had, I was in court for a divorce. I had just gotten custody of Bella because he was on such a bad path. And I was trying so hard to protect this baby that we made. 
So fast forward, I go through all of that. I complete parole. I had owned my own business. I had made bath and body products like soaps, hand lotions, yada, yada, yada. And um, I got bored and I was like, I'm going to have a life. I'm going to go out. Alcohol is not my problem. So where do you go in Delaware County when you want to go out? You go out, you go to the bar. I went to the bar. I made fast friends. Fast forward a few months. I'm wasted. You know? Who's with the baby at that point? My parents. Because I lived at home with them. Yeah. Right. So I had no friends, no life, no nothing. All I had was Bella and my parents. I was very, very unhappy. As a woman, as a human, you know, I was very unhappy. I did not go to meetings. I did not work on myself. I did not do any of the things that we knew we need to do as people in recovery to maintain that sobriety. I just, I'm sober. That's it. I was like a dry drunk, dry addict. You know, I was just sober. Sure. Mm -hmm. So I make fast friends. Someone's like, Hey, you want a line of cocaine? Here we go again. Sure. Cocaine's not my drug of choice. As long as it's not heroin, I will be okay. Because nothing ever happened bad when I was doing cocaine. It was the heroin. Right. That's right, what's bad. Right. Right. You know. What a mess. Um, yeah. I end up, uh, through this mutual friend, situations arise, I end up meeting my husband, who is now my husband. He wasn't at the time. He did it. He was sober from alcohol. He had nine years of sobriety from alcohol because he's an alcoholic, but he still did cocaine occasionally. He and I got together. The cocaine fire was lit. We had a very tumultuous relationship. You know, we both, we were both just sober from our drug of choices, but we were still actively using cocaine and other things. It was a mess. Mm -hmm. Um, One thing led to another and um, you know, I was introduced to methamphetamines and he had already previously done them and I was a virgin to them. Here I am, you know, naive to their power. I don't know why every drug has kicked my ass. I thought, oh, this one's different. And methamphetamines was really becoming a thing in our area. And it just so happens I knew a girl who knew a girl who sold it and I could get it and nobody else could. So I said, we're going to be meth dealers. And he was like, this is a bad idea. And I was like, sit down, I'm deciding. And he was like, this is a bad idea. Well, you had done two bids at that point, right? Technically, you had done, I had done three. A bid. And, it, and, okay. a, and a violation that was a bid in itself. Right. So, so you, you were experienced at being in and out of the system. But I think you had crazy denial. Like oh. you just did not see what the fuck was going on. And you saw like, you were still using, you know what I mean? Like you I saw a better a past- than mentality. Like I thought because of how I was. Raised, it couldn't happen to you. Right. Correct. I am the poster child to, it can happen to you, <laughs> you know? So, um, long story short, we sold drugs for about a year. One of the girls that lived with me, her and her sister snitched us out. They came in full bore. Like we had, you know, committed mass murders and took us out um everybody else ended up they gave us like a they they took the entire house trying to say like we they everybody interfered with my arrest and this that and the third it was a bunch of bullshit everybody else got out I got two sealed indictments and I ended up doing three years I got sentenced to three years in state prison two years post supervision um I had a plan set up for Bella that completely fell through. My parents ended up taking her. They still have her to this day. I'm currently. That's great. Well, in a sense, it is, it isn't. Eh, It's great. It's, it's great that she's not with strangers. Mm -hmm. It's great that, that she's with people who love her. It's great that she's with her her blood. You know, that's a a big upside to this thing. You never like, you never got into like, meetings at all I did meetings uh in the very very when I first moved upstate I did meetings during that three month time and all that was there in the area was AA and they were very like I'd be like hi I'm Jen I'm an addict and they'd be like you know like like I was I don't know like an alien or something like we don't do addiction in here it's not for drug addicts this is Alcoholics Anonymous so I got a bad taste in my mouth and it just didn't do it for me and I do believe in a lot of the principles and the theories and the things that they go by because they work. They do. They absolutely do. The 
commitment and the beliefs and having to believe in something greater than yourself, because, you know, you will fall as a human being. You have to have faith in something else. You know, it's by the grace of God that I'm here. And I fully believe that. This last time was the pivotal point in my life. I was a mom and being separated from my child was the absolute worst thing I have ever experienced in my life. It, it, you know, I I went through so much to protect that baby and keep that baby safe from her own flesh and blood even. And to have her taken away from me and so dramatically was just the worst thing in my life. Truly. How do you, because I remember you mentioned in the beginning of us talking that you don't talk to your mother anymore. I do not. Like, so how do you, how do you communicate with your daughter? I communicate solely through my father. My parents are still married. Um, and we communicate solely through him. And the communication is, can you put Bella on the phone? It's not really anything. But, you know, I mean, so I, I ended up doing a year and a half in, bed, in, in prison. And then uh, halfway, after a year and a half, I said, I'm, I, I, I'm going home. It's time. I've done enough work on myself. I'm to a point in my life where I feel comfortable and confident And I accept the fact that I'm an addict. I accept the fact that these are these things that I have to do. And I applied to go to Lakeview Shop, which is boot camp. And I completed the six-month program. And just, so the 24th of this month will be 19 months that I'm home from prison. I now have my car. Yeah, I'm a CARC, a SERPA, a rape crisis counselor, a Narcan trainer. And I have gotten all these certifications I came home from prison and I found a recovery center. I met a recovery coach and I learned of becoming sober and he taught them to me and he coached me and he guided me. And, um, I really started to continue to work on myself. Like I had when I was in shock and, uh, there came a time for a, a class that came up to become a recovery coach. He nominated me. I was able to obtain a scholarship to be able to go and I became a recovery coach. And then the same agency, had an opening for a female recovery coach and I applied and got the job. And that was a very pivotal point for me because I realized I was more than just an addict. I was more than just my past life that I was able to have a future. Well, the coolest thing is that you, you saw very, very quickly how every experience you had up till that point would pay off for somebody else and it would give you, and it would give you a purpose and you'd understand your job intrinsically because you lived it you know you fucking really took a long way around to get to the to the finish line and a lot of pain obviously and like I don't say that lightly like a lot of loss and obviously it's Mm -hmm. it's a tough story but you know you seem pretty happy and 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 you seem very sober and that's that's what really counts what I want to know though is because when we were talking through it you know I always like to look for the moment where someone was like I'm done like that was too much I'm done I can't do this anymore. Or like, and like, really, like there is no, I'm done. Like I've accepted that. Like, but there is a, there is a, a moment where you're like, I can't, I can't do it. Like there isn't, I'm done. And then you have to keep, I, I find that you have to either keep saying I'm done every day, or you have to like, just keep going in that direction. Like, when did it hit you that like you were done with it? Well, like I was saying before, being separated from my child was an all-time low. Uh, that was a, that was a totally different hell than I was used to. No and rights. Like you, when you lose your rights as a mother, it's like that's different than having living at your parents' house with the baby and being like here and there because you're still kind of a kid at that point. Once that, that changes, that's when reality really fucking hit you in the face right so my parents would not allow me to see her for 15 months I had to take them to court to get them to bring a visit and this was my baby we god we didn't I couldn't pee alone you know and then it was just nothing due to my own stupidity absolutely so that was because you're an addict it's not it's it's not because it's not because of your stupidity it's because you were an addict who was due using. to my disease, I should say. And you're absolutely it was right. Not your stu- it's not your stupidity. I mean, I understand right. why you would say that. And I would say the same thing. Right. But, like, it's important to recognize that you're not doing that now. Oh, you absolutely know what I mean? not. Uh, I have four years sober right. this October. So, you know, I mean, I don't even smoke cigarettes anymore. <laughs> so my husband gets mad because he's like, why do we have all this healthy food? Because I don't want to die. <laughs> you know. So right. exactly. um, I just 
I got to a point and I really was made to uh, work on myself and deal with the past traumas from my childhood and how I grew up and bad relationships and all that while I was incarcerated at Lakeview Shock. And I got support from my my platoon sisters and the counselors and the DIs, because there's not COs, there's not corrections officers there, there's DIs, there's drill instructors. And I was really made to work on myself like I had never before. So I developed a self-esteem that I never had. You know, and I think that was really the turning point. I don't think I ever had an I'm done point, but I had an I'm better than this point. Right. And, you know, I came home and all these things started happening for me. And I was like, oh, this is, this is what sobriety is like, that this is, this, this is, this is real, you know? And I, I, I was always so afraid of being sober because it was going to be boring or, you know, I don't want to live this vanilla life. And it is so the opposite. Holy shit. I'm, I'm busier now than I ever was. You know, I have so many, and I have so many things to be proud of and grateful for that I never had before. You know, who cares how much dope you sell? Like that's irrelevant. Well, in the beginning, you don't realize that there's a ceiling on that. Like, like right. that's something that occurs to me all the time. It's like, if drugs had infinite potential, the way sobriety does, I might not have gotten sober. Correct. You know, dr- drugs doesn't, it just doesn't have infinite mm-hmm. potential the way sobriety right. does. Right. You know, drugs has a ceiling where you can't get high anymore and you run out of money. And like, mm-hmm. even if you have infinite money, you're not going to get any higher than you were when you were doing it the first time. Like, right. it does not have the same potential and like I think your story is incredible Thank um you. I do appreciate your time and uh you know my ugly face is now going to oh, be on YouTube it. doing this I'm thing super excited I think it's, it's gonna happened be really good. and um um yeah you guys are just gonna have to figure out what to do with all of the stops and starts the wi-fi went out four times it was an honor though and a pleasure to have this conversation it went forever yeah but like when are you gonna when have you ever been interviewed so in depth about your addiction uh this was probably the most in depth and this is my first podcast so this is super cool for me like i'm proud of this this is another gift of sobriety that my life has brought me and to be all you know like cheesy and cliche and shit but this is super cool for me i've never done this before so you sir are my first Oh, I am honored. Thank you, Jen. So thank you so much. I do appreciate it. Have a a great night. You too. Yes, right on. All right, cool. Bye. That was an experiment with Jen Cutting. I thought her story had it all. Fucking crazy dopey. Uh, My favorite thing about it is that she's from Staten Island. My second favorite thing about it is that it goes from total innocence to total dopey you know with tragedy and obviously prison time hard drugs all that stuff in between the best part is she is sober now and she's a great advocate for sober people check out her youtube channel it's jen cutting stay strong dopey nation and fucking toodles for chris i want to take a walk around the world i wonder would it do me any good Until I get some money in my pocket, then I guess I'll just have to walk around my neighborhood. But I want to be good so bad. Want to be so good, so bad, so bad. I want to be good so bad. Bad desire's all I ever had. And I want to take a ride up in the sky. What's this aeroplane just passed me by? And I want to see a Lear jetliner take a dive Just to show all of these people what it means to be alive But I want to be good so bad Want to be so good, so bad, so bad I want to be good so bad Bad desire's all I ever had And my shadow's getting smaller and smaller And it's time to where I stand Shadow's getting smaller and smaller And it's time to where I stand And I wonder would they pay it any mind When I leave this busted city far behind I'll take the high road however far it winds Because peace and love are very, very, very hard to find And I want to be good so bad Want to be good, 
so bad, so bad. I want to be good so bad. Bad desires all I ever had. Damn it, all these suckers make me mad. And it's all I ever had. And it's all I ever had. And these suckers make me mad and I want to call my dad and it's all I ever had 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 and these suckers make me mad and it's all I ever had and I want to call my dad and it's all I ever had and it's all I ever had